we're going to do today is I'm just going to go over a little bit about the um, UBC MBA program, do a little program overview. Then we're going to talk about different career options that this program can um, can prepare you for. So um, as I was I was was presented earlier, my name is Vivian Tran, and I'm a manager of recruitment and admissions at the UBC Sauter School of Business. Um, so why a UBC MBA? So just to talk a little bit about our reputation around the world, um, UBC, the UBC MBA program is one of the top 45 global elite as ranked by the QS business rankings. We're ranked number one in Canada for business and economics, and we have 40,000 Sauter alumni in 80 countries around the world. So this 40,000 alumni is just counting the business school alumni. If you're looking at the larger UBC alumni network, we are looking at about, um, 300,000 alumni in 140 countries around the world. So UBC is um, a global institution. It is a thought leadership institution, and it's one of the top 40 universities in the world. So Vancouver, a little bit about Vancouver. I already told you a little bit about the, the weather here. So it does have the warmest weather in Canada, which is helpful for those of you that aren't from, um, you know, colder countries. Um, and it is also a city that, um, you know, is on the west coast of North America. We are on that um, west coast technological innovation hub. We're only about two hours drive north of Seattle. So those of you who probably know, Seattle's Amazon headquarters. So we're also a tech hub in addition to being um, what is called the Asia Pacific gateway. So in North America, there's certain gateway cities that are kind of like gateways to the emerging um, Asia Pacific region and Vancouver is one of them. So two um, geostrategic advantages to Vancouver there. One is the, um, the proximity to Silicon Valley. Another one is proximity to the emerging Asia Pacific markets. Um, we are also home to a variety of different um, companies. Um, Lululemon started out in Vancouver. Um, there's also companies like Amazon, which are, you know, large global conglomerates that are expanding quite rapidly in Vancouver. And, you know, you got like, um, uh, you know, uh, traditional consulting like McKinsey has offices in Vancouver, Big Four, as well as companies like Microsoft, for example. And um, like was mentioned earlier, Vancouver is always ranked as one of the most livable cities in the world. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a medium sized city like Vancouver proper is about a million people. So but then it's, it's big enough to still feel like a very metropolitan city. It's got everything you need, but it's got a lot less traffic than some of the you guys living in um, larger cities might experience and super safe. As an example, like I ride my bike to work every day when we were still kind of going to things in person. And, you know, as a single woman, I could like ride home from a party on a bicycle like at midnight and have no problems at all. So just a little bit about the city, the weather, you know, what it's like to live there. So a little bit about the what the full-time MBA journey looks like. So it is a 16-month program. And so here you're looking at the first part of the program and it starts in August of every year. So currently we are recruiting for the August 2021 entry of the program. And you can see here the program always starts with foundational modules in the first part of the program. But these green parts that you see, those are kind of considered kind of experiential learning components of the program. So as you are doing your foundational modules, you'll also be doing major case studies to um, you know, mobilize the knowledge that you're learning in the classroom into solving actual business cases. And then, um, then you'll be on to career track modules and electives. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about career tracks when we talk about you know, the career advantages of doing this MBA program. But you can see throughout the course of the journey, um, this is the second part of the program where you would um, do a, a four month paid internship um, so, you know, once you finish foundational modules, there's also going to be this um, trip abroad, which is called Global Immersion. And you can see Global Immersion, uh, before you actually go abroad, is actually a project that you start at the very beginning of the program where you're consulting for an international firm. And then for the last two weeks, you actually go abroad, you do site visits, company pitches, and you actually meet the company you are um, you were consulting for. So in addition to, you know, doing major case studies, this program is helping you build your resume as you go through the program in a strategic manner by giving you these types of real life consulting projects. So first you would do foundational modules and then you would do um, a local consulting project here. And then um, later on you would actually, at the same time you're doing this like global consulting project and then you would actually go abroad. Now I've got a lot of questions about like, you know, GIE, global immersion experience, you know, it's there's the last part of it is abroad. What's going to happen during COVID? Well, you know, 
the the bulk of the work is normally done you know online anyway as you're doing your course components in Vancouver so even if worst case you know by time you start the program the vaccination you know like program to eradicate COVID hasn't completed yet and there's no way to go abroad rest assured this would still go on because the bulk of the the substantive part of the project is always kind of done online anyway and then the last two weeks is usually when you go abroad and that's more about meeting the company and actually being in that country which is obviously an amazing experience but rest assured this project will still go on even if COVID restrictions don't allow us to take those two weeks abroad which would be unfortunate but it would mean that you would still get to do this project. Now you can see the second part of the program is when you would do a four month paid internship. So that internship is, is typically paid. So students typically make about $3,000 to $6,000 a month up to four months. So it's an additional ROI in your education. Or you could um, do um, launch an entrepreneurial venture and we do have seed funding for students that choose to do that. And then you can see the last part of the program is when you finish off the program with electives in Vancouver, or you can go on an optional um, international exchange. Now you can see here throughout this bottom part, you see career and professional development. And that just means that you have complete career support. So you have a full service business support center that while you're going through the program, which includes personalized career coaching and uh, mentorship programs, um, career development pro uh, programs. So all sorts of things to get you ready to make the transition post MBA into the career your um, your desire so that's just kind of an overview of the um, foundational modules and thematic courses that you do um, during the first two periods and then um, global experience so one of the features of this program is um, a lot of different options to do global to have global experiences UBC is a very international school we have a variety of international um, partnerships no less than three opportunities for you to take a global experience now I've already talked about one of them which is our global um, immersion project so that's your global consulting project that is a mandatory project for all students so everybody will get at least one international experience as part of the UBC MBA program but there's two additional experiences that are optional um, that you you could choose to be a part of. So one we already talked about, Global Immersion, and then another one is our partnership with Yale University in the Global Network of Advanced Management. So UBC is the only Canadian member of this um, elite kind of 30 member um, school. And um, they're um, top business schools from all around the world, including schools like Yale, Oxford, Berkeley. And they offer our students um, an opportunity to um, do these global exchanges with one of these institutions on a thematic subject matter. So, for example, UBC ran um, a Genome Network Week on sustainability. Yale has run them on marketing organizational behavior. Um, Berkeley has run them on um, Bay Area innovation and, and entrepreneurship. So they often have a regional or institutional bent to them. And that's a way for you to get kind of elective credits back towards your MBA. But also um, because of this partnership with Yale, we also offer a dual degree with Yale University. So for those of you that want kind of both the Canada US experience, you could get it through this program by doing the dual degree with Yale. And these, these are two standalone degrees. So it would be the UBC MBA degree and the Yale Master of Advanced Management degree. So um, done by themselves, these two degrees would normally take you three years to do. But um, if you do it in a dual format, um, you can actually do the, the two degrees in an abbreviated amount of time. So it'd be um, the first year to be at UBC, so 12 months at UBC, and then the next nine months at um, Yale. And when you graduate, you'd have both a UBC degree and a Yale degree and access to both networks. So that's really interesting for those of you that are interested in that. And I'm also available after we're going to send a follow up email out. So you can always reach out to us if you wanted to know more about this dual degree or anything else about our program. So interesting option there. Uh, we do have your traditional study abroad program with 34 exchange partners all around the world as well. Now just a little bit about our class profile. You can see what the last entry class looked like. Um, you can see they come from a variety of different undergraduate um, backgrounds, almost parity in terms of male, female, about a class size, about 100 students every year and an age range about 24 to 39 last year. Average years of work experience was six. And you can see a very international um, component of the program is 46% international last year and a variety of different work experience industries um, represented. 
So admission requirements, we are looking about at a 76% um, for um, your GPA, or you could write, or not or, like one of the requirements is also to write the standardized test, either a 650 on the GMAT or a 320 on the GRE would be considered competitive. Minimum of two years of work experience and two professional references. And there's a variety of small written and video essays that you would prepare in advance and, and upload to your application. Um, English proficiency tests, if you did not do your first degree in English, um, or any degree you could do, like maybe a first degree was not in English, but that you did a master's degree in English, that would count to waive the English proficiency test as well. If you did have to write the test, you are looking at a 7 for the IELTS or a 100 for the TOEFL, and that is like kind of the average score. And actually on that point, um, if you guys were interested in, um, you know, uh, permanent residency in Canada eventually, because probably I'll, I'll mention it here, when you graduate from the MBA program, you have automatic eligibility to apply for a work permit up to three years in Canada. So it's called a post-graduation work permit. And that after working in one year in Canada, you can apply for um, permanent residency, in which case like writing the IELTS is advantageous because that's the test they would ask you for, for a Canadian permanent residency anyway. So those of you that are interested in a Canadian MBA to help you transition to a life in Canada, that's something that you might want to think about ahead of time is to to write the IELTS um, because that's the test that they asked for for um, PR status. And then um, addition to the per uh, back to the admission requirements, um, uh, the personal interview is the last stage of the um, uh, admission requirements. So that's kind of the admission requirements in a nutshell. Deadlines, fees and scholarships. So you can see the second round deadline um, is coming up January 5th. Um, and then we do have a third round deadline of April 6th and the final round of May 4th. So I recommend that because we admit on the rolling basis that you try to apply early if possible because like we have this many spots at the beginning and this much scholarship at the beginning and it slowly whittles down as you go towards the last round. So applying early it, you know, with the strongest application possible is advantageous but obviously don't rush an application, always put in the strongest application possible. Um, now, fees um, for PRs and Canadian citizens, we are looking at 50,000 Canadian. That's approximately 37, 38,000 US dollars for those of you doing the conversion. Um, Canadian dollars is always about 25 to 30% weaker than the US dollar. So that's an advantage for those of you coming to Canada as well, is that you're paying less for everything because everything is about 25 to 30% cheaper on the exchange of whatever currency you're doing um, compared to the US dollar, for example. Uh, international students, the fee is 85,000 um, Canadian dollars. So converted is about 70,000 US dollars. If I'm doing the conversion right in my head, you guys with calculators can do it better than me. Um, and then scholarships is a range of scholarships anywhere typically between 10 to 40,000 are scholarship amounts. Um, and then 35 to 40% of the MBA class would be eligible for a scholarship. Now, let's talk about careers in this program and how the program prepares you for a post-MBA career. So in the, U in the MBA program, there are different career tracks that you can pursue. So one of them is um, technology and analytics leadership, another one is finance, another one is products and service management, a fourth one is innovation entrepreneurship, and then the fifth option, of course, is to customize your um, career track to whatever your specific career interests are. So there's um, a variety of different types of career tracks you can follow during the MBA program. And um, the technology and analytics leadership is a new one um, that we, we just implemented for this year. So, uh, so the, the, the entry cohort that we had for August 2020 which was of course delayed to January 2021 because of COVID, that was the first entry cohort with this new career track. So this um, technology and analytics leadership track is kind of responding to the industry demand for um, individuals with kind of analytics experience. As you know, a lot of business decisions now are being moved to kind of data-driven decision-making model. So this, if you guys are interested in it, is a really interesting track for anyone to consider that who's interested in data and and looking at using data to make um, strategic business decisions. And it is highly in demand at the moment. Um, experiential learning components is another way we prepare you for um, you know, your future career. 
Um, so, you know, we talked a lot about it when I was talking about the program journey. So a variety of different internship experiences that you do at the beginning, middle and end of the program to prepare you to apply not only the knowledge that you learn in the classroom, but also do actual consulting projects like a domestic consulting project right after your foundational modules and then the international consulting project in the form of GIE. Both these experiences are things you can put on your resume and show that you are kind of ready by the time the MBA is over to take on these types of projects and maybe even build a few strategic um, relationships that will help you land a job afterwards. And of course, the big project that you would do um, in the program that students really use quite strategically, um, experiential learning wise, is the paid internship component. So that's the four month paid internship. So it is an ROI, of course, to help you pay off some you know, bills and things like that and your tuition, but more strategically, it's an opportunity for a lot of students to try out a different industry. Um, to work with a company they're interested in working for and potentially translate that into a full-time job after they graduate. So a big one that the students use um, in terms of experiential learning strategically in terms of their career is that four-month paid internship to help them pivot into the career or the company or the industry that they are most interested in doing. So summer experience there. Now, of course, it could also be um, the summer experience could also take the form of an entrepreneurial project. So some students will choose to launch ventures, um, you know, in lieu of doing an internship at a company. So those of you that are interested or, or more entrepreneurial minded or more business owner minded, like you might choose to actually use this program um, to launch your own venture as well. Personalized career coaching is an integral part of what we offer at UBC. So obviously, like when you join this UBC MBA program, we know that you're joining because you have specific career goals in mind. So that's why career and professional um, career coaching, like that's an integral part of the program that lasts throughout your, throughout your time as a UBC student. So one of the main goals that we're gonna be looking at when you're in an MBA program at UBC and really for any good MBA program out there is to help you place in the job that you're interested in. So one really strategic thing that you wanna do before approaching the MBA decision is to think really clearly about what your career goals are and which MBA program works best for you. So for example, if you were really interested in Canada or you're interested in the West Coast of Canada for, you know, like you're interested in technology, for example, um, or you want to get part of that Asia Pacific gateway, um, think about the companies you want to work for, right? Post MBA, think about that before you choose the MBA program. Think about the companies you want to work for, the roles you want to work for, research if those roles and companies exist in that market. Those are all really strategic things you should think about before you do the MBA decision, because you should, you should shape your MBA decision be, to, be uh, behind what your career goals are, right? Not choose the MBA and then like, then think about like, because you want to, you there's a um, there's a strategic advantage to doing your MBA in the market where you want to work. And that's definitely the case in Canada because Canada is very referral oriented. So if you're really interested in Vancouver, definitely consider UBC because we have a very, very strong market, obviously here in a home market, as an example. So think about your career goals before you choose the MBA, work your MBA goals around what your career goals are. Um, and that's gonna help you through the application process as well. So, you know, like we take the, your career decisions very seriously um, when, you know, we're considering you as a candidate to the program in addition to your overall profile. And then accordingly throughout your time as an MBA student, you'd get like very um, personalized career coaching as you're going through, you know, warm connections to our networks, referrals, access to exclusive job lists, so those are things that you would access um, in our MBA program and in many good MBA programs around the world as well. Um, so we also at UBC offer like a comprehensive career training, um, sorry, EQ training program. So EQ is kind of emotional intelligence. And, you know, like if you've done some like reading or some listen to like, um, uh, what some thought leaders have said about the future of business, oftentimes the most important skills they say that matter in terms of determining success, it's not like a hard skill. Oftentimes it's not a hard skill that they mention. More and more now, people and business leaders are indicating that it's emotional intelligence. It's one of these kind of soft skills, the creativity, the ability to um, effectively communicate and lead others, the ability to build relationships and manage difficult emotions. Those are the skills that are most indicative of good leaders and effective leaders and the ones that are most likely to experience success in the future. So um, at UBC, Sauter, for example, the Business Career Center is um, partnered with a firm called Roche Martin to develop like a comprehensive EQ development program. So when you're a student at UBC, you would do like a comprehensive kind of EQ profile. We build you this profile 
profile about like what your strengths and weaknesses are EQ wise and then how to kind of build and advance on the um, kind of EQ profile areas that could you know build you a more complete and more comprehensive EQ profile for yourself as you go out into the world so that's something really unique that we've built um, at UBC at the at our business career center and all students will have access to this um, so next steps um, sorry <laughs> my colleague's name there but my name is um, Vivian Tran of course um, but you can always email us through our um, main line here at mba at solder.ubc.ca and here the link down here you can see um, uh, different types of information sessions that you can um, attend obviously for now it's going to be virtual but we also in that link about their upcoming events we also have a lot of pre-recorded webinars that you can access so you can watch more about like different alumni talk about their experiences in the MBA program and different thematic um, events that we have done in the past great so we're on to the question period so um, I think uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a moderated panel we can also check if there's any questions that had come up um, in the chat as well. So Perfect. I'm gonna, yeah. For this presentation and uh, we're expecting your questions to, to Vivian. Uh, we have uh, quite, quite, a, quite some few uh, attendees and we will be happy to receive your questions uh, in the Q&A part of, uh, of your uh, navigation panel. In case you're logging in through a mobile device, you can uh, click on the question mark. There's a question mark on your screen. When you click on this question mark, you will be able to ask your questions to, to Vivian. Uh, we do have some questions coming in already, and I will be happy to um, to, to transfer them to uh, to Vivian to answer, but uh, I will be happy to, to receive some more. So please do type in your questions right now. Um, there is a question here from, from Patricia uh, de los Rios Martinez, and who is asking us, um, she's from Mexico and has 10 years of working experience, what kind of scholarships are available for uh, studying an MBA in Vancouver? Yeah, so like I mentioned in the presentation, we have a variety of different entrance scholarships available. They range anywhere from 10 to 40,000. So like the largest ones obviously cover about like half tuition, for example. Um, and we allocate these um, according to a complete candidate profile. So we're looking at, you know, your academic profile in terms of your grades and your um, test scores. You wanna score in the competitive range if possible, it's the GMAT or GRE. So a competitive score for the GMAT would be a 650, for example, and the GRE would be a 320 plus. And then we're gonna look at your work experience and we're gonna look at also what your objectives are as you communicate during the application process. So what you say in your, your essays, for example, you know, what you say in the interview about like what your career goals are. So like I mentioned before, these programs, like an MBA program, especially at a place like UBC, it's, it is, um, you know, a, a academic, a academically rigorous program, but it's not the only thing we look for. We also look at what your learning objectives are and how our program fits into what your learning objectives are, as well as your career objectives. So do your research um, about what your career goals are, like where do you want to work, which markets, like is it in Canada, and which market in Canada, Vancouver, Toronto, like do that type of research, what companies are you interested in, what industries are you interested in, what job roles are you interested in, like be able to answer those questions, because that makes up a part of a complete profile as well. So we're looking at a combination of things in terms of who gets a scholarship, we're looking at you know your academic profile which should be strong um, and then we're also looking at like you know the quality to side of your application as well like you know why did you choose ubc solder what is it about our program that is um that you're going to use to help you leverage to what your career goals are and do you know what your career goals are and are you able to articulate them well so all those things are things we look at you don't have to apply separately for scholarships you're automatically considered so um if you get an offer of admission from us you would also know how much scholarship you got that's perfect. And the same line of, uh, of questions, uh, she is also asking us if uh, there is a possibility to work some hours per week or on weekends during the program. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, yes, so under the Canadian study permit, you are allowed to work 20 hours a week. And then if you are coming with a spouse or a common law partner, they are actually eligible to apply for a full time work permit under your study permit. So if you're coming with a spouse or common law partner, they can actually work full time in Canada while you study so that so if anyone's coming with a partner, that's something to keep in mind as well, because then your partner can actually work full time in Canada as you study. 
Okay, that's perfect. Um, we have a question here also by uh, by Junior by Junior uh, Zakpiombo. Uh, he is asking us if the GMAT test is a requirement for admission. And uh, I would add to that, uh, what is the uh, which is more more important, the GMAT test or working experience? Okay. So the GMAT um, test is is like it's typically a requirement, but for students with strong quantitative backgrounds, there is the option to apply for a waiver of the GMAT or GRE. Now, the, not everybody would qualify for the waiver. You'd have to come from a fairly quantitative background, or you come from like a BCom background with strong grades, right? So A, you would have to come from a quantitative background like a science or mathematics or economics or um, you know, core business background like a BCom, but you'd also have to have strong grades in those, in those um, disciplines, like strong grades meaning like at least a B plus or higher, especially for the quantitative courses. And then like if you meet those requirements, which are laid out in the application, so it's, it's something you would apply for within the application itself. If you meet those requirements, you can apply for a GMAT GRE waiver and see if it's granted. If it's not granted, you would then have to write the GMAT or the GRE. So um, we are looking for either a GMAT of 650 or higher as a competitive score or 320 or higher on the GRE. If you're interested in management consulting, then we would recommend that you write the GMAT. Um, and then like they do ask for a score of about 700 or higher if you're interested in management consulting. Um, and then like work experience or GMAT, like they are looking at separately, right? GMAT is looking at your academic profile. Work experience is looking at, you know, your candidate profile. So there's difference between like, like you need the academic profile to, in order to get into the program. And then we need a candidate profile to also get into the program as well. You can't just have one or the other, right? If you have a strong candidate profile, but very weak academic profile, you probably won't make it into the program because there's no, no indication to us that you can survive the academic rigors of the program. You need both, right? So one doesn't cancel out the other. You also can't just have super high test scores and have nothing on the candidate side, like no career goals, no learning objectives. Like even if you had a super high score, then we would probably also not let you into the program. You kind of need both. So one doesn't cancel out the other. Hopefully that makes sense. Definitely, it's uh, everything is important and uh, everyone of course should contribute to, to the program because it's co-learning as well, usually mm -hmm. MBA degrees. Um, we have a few uh, questions by, um, one of them is by, by Nirmala and uh, she's asking us, uh, she has a, a bachelor's in, uh, in medicine. She has worked for five years in, in the medical field, uh, but she wants to, to do an MBA and what are the career opportunities for healthcare managers with uh, this MBA? This is one of, one of the questions in that direction. And we also have another question from a person that has studied in the uh, ha that has a psychology degree, and he asks if he can apply to the MBA program. So they're kind of related to those two. Yeah. So we always have a, a like um, an, a percentage of students that come from the healthcare discipline. Um, you know, sometimes they're um, you know um, in primary care, like a doctor or a nurse, for example, or sometimes pharmacists, and they have really good career outcomes from this program. Um, oftentimes they would end up working in more administrative roles if they were interested in moving away from primary care, like patient level care, for example, and they wanted to move into or move into more administrative roles. They would oftentimes look at an MBA to teach them how to run like an actual organization because healthcare is obviously primary care, but there's a lot of business involved with like operations and processes and things like that as well. So like, you know, an, an MBA combined with, you know, your you know, patient level care experience or your healthcare experience, um, applied healthcare experience, that's very valuable because you understand how the business works from the, the, um, from the level of a practitioner, right? So you know the ins and outs of that only the way like a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist or, you know, a psychologist would know, but combine that with an MBA gives you like a really big advantage in terms of moving into leadership roles in these organizations, which is what we've seen our grads do is work in leadership roles in like the provincial healthcare authority in, in Vancouver, for example, or in different international organizations uh, where they, they take on kind of leadership roles in, in those types of umbrella organizations. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of different opportunities for students um, with that background. Okay, that's perfect. Um, 
another question that we have is <clears throat> uh, by Olga. She is asking us if um, COVID, uh, what is the impact of COVID on international students' admission? Do we need higher test scores now than before? Uh, good question. I mean, it has COVID has obviously been an inconvenience to everybody, but it has not impacted our admission of international students at all. So you don't like you would be the same standard as pre-COVID um, as post-COVID. Um, the only thing that it's impacted is our ability to move around. So everything remains the same. Our standards have not been altered. Um, so you can rest assured that we're not judging people more harshly or um, with more stringent measures because of COVID. Great. Um, so <clears throat> there is also a question here regarding lodging. Is lodging included? Hajar is asking us if lodging is lodging included in the in the fee, and where do students stay during their study? Yeah. So typically speaking, with MBA tuition rates, like lodging will never be included in that rate. Very, very like if you look at any MBA um, like kind of tuition fees, it would never usually include lodging. So the same same with us. The fee is just the tuition fee. It does not include lodging. But in terms of where um, students usually stay, they would either stay on campus, like in this photo that you can see here on the slides, you can actually see some of the um, some of the buildings that students would typically stay in, like kind of the high rises there. Those are usually where students stay. That gives you a good idea of how close you'd be to um, uh, basically a solder building, which is like uh, just I'm getting my geography right. I believe it's like right here, actually. Um, uh, so yeah, so like some students will stay, you know, um, on campus. There's also a lot of off-campus housing as well. At UBC, when you um, when you're a student at UBC, you you have free access to a public transportation system, and UBC is a transportation hub. So a lot of students will actually live off campus as well. Like, you know, there's a neighborhood called Kitsilano, which is about like a 10 minute bus ride away, and so students will live there. It's it's right by the beach, so it's like you know quite quite pleasant to live in. Um, or like they can live on campus as well. So students will live, um, you know, either on campus or, or off campus as well. Perfect. Regarding the uh, the study process, uh, we have a question here. If um, if the uh, if if there are any uh, study trips to uh, included in the program, and are they included in the fee, or do they have to cover them themselves? Yeah, so like the the tuition components of the study abroad um, uh, experiences that we have. So I mentioned three. One is the global immersion consulting project. Another one are which is mandatory. So that's usually it will cost you about five thousand to cover your flight and accommodation. So we always ask students to allocate about additional five thousand to cover the flight and accommodations for that. But all the experiences, the tuition, all that is included. The optional experiences like the Yale um, the Yale exchange program or the study abroad program, the tuition components are all included, but you would be responsible for your flight and accommodations. Perfect. And uh, is there also an internship included in the in the program? And how does the school support uh, students after they come out of the program? Yeah, so um, there is a four month paid internship included in the program. There's there's actually three internship programs in the pro in the, the full time MBA program. So one would be the one right after the three month foundational period where you consult for a local company. And then another is the global immersion project, which is consulting for an international firm. And then there's another a third one would be the four month paid internship. So that one's a paid experience. The other two were not paid. They're, they're just to build experience. But the third one is actually paid for four months. And um, the Business Career Center does play a very active role in helping students land that internship. So, you know, the students that land the best internships, however, are the ones that have an idea of what they want to do. Because right at the beginning, they'll start talking with the Business Career Center about, like, you know, what companies they want to aim for, who should they talk to in our network to get an understanding about what types of internship opportunities might be available, which is why I stress again and again, it's very important to understand what your career goals are you know, going into the MBA program. And we reward students when they know that with, you know, th those are students that typically get the scholarships as well. And those are students who are often the most successful throughout the course of the program is knowing where they want to land. And then we play an active role in helping you land that. Great, thank you. 
Uh, Ragid Khalifa is asking us if there is any age limit on MBA admission. There's no age limit for MBA admissions. Um, we, as you can see, last year we had a range of ages, anywhere from 24 to 39. Um, we're basically looking at students who are ready to take this program, who are ready to benefit from the MBA program, um, regardless of what their age ages are, right? Like if you are, you know, 39 and you're ready to benefit from this program, your career goals make sense. And then we look at you and what your learning objectives are and what your career goals are. And we're like, yeah, this person's 39, but like this person's ready to benefit from the MBA program then that person's a good candidate for the program. On the other end of the spectrum, if you are only 24 and you are very mature and you have good career goals and they make sense for what the MBA offers, then you can be an equally strong candidate to the program as well. Perfect. Um, you, you mentioned that Vancouver is uh, quite a nice city to live in. And uh, furthermore, uh, the extracurricular activities and the networking opportunities are something that is of interest to most of the candidates. Can you tell us a little bit more about the extracurricular activities that can be done throughout the program and if there are any additional networking options for, for people and how are they playing out right now with the COVID situation? Yeah, so there's a variety of different extracurricular activities you can get engaged with. So some of them are more career oriented and others are just more for fun. So like the more career oriented extracurricular um, programs can be very strong training programs to just kind of an interest level. So um, I'll start with the, the more training programs first. For example, extracurricularly, we have things like the strategy consulting mentorship program. So that's a four weekend boot camp for those that are interested in entering the strategy consulting um, world. And so if you can pass this four weekend boot camp, you're actually guaranteed first round interviews with all of the consulting firms. So, you know, the top tier, uh, the big three, I guess you would call them in the big four as well. And um, so it is competitive entry into this training program. So you need at least a 700 GMAT to get in. But if you do pass, you're, you're guaranteed interviews with all of the, um, the consulting firms, which is significant because that puts you at the top 25% of the application funnel. So that's really significant there. We also have the brand management training program, as an example, capital markets training program as well. So those are all extracurricular. Um, and those are more career oriented. So that, that's that's career oriented stuff. And then we also have some um, clubs that are more interest level, but still kind of career oriented, like the Net Impact Club, the Finance Club, the um, Entrepreneurship Club, things like that, Women in Business Club. And then we have like just the fun clubs, which are things like the Book Club, the Sailing Club. Um, quite recently, we actually had a couple of students look at um, UBC and say, hey, there's, a, there's actually a golf course. For those of you that are interested in golfing, UBC has everything. It's it's right on the ocean, so it's surrounded by three sides by ocean. So you're, you're 300 meters away from the beach, uh, and there's like a, a small forest on the other end as well. And then there's also a golf course on campus. So a couple of years ago, some of our students saw that we had a golf course on campus, but we didn't have a golf club, and that's that was a travesty to that student because golfing is like a big business activity. So they started a golf club. So now we have a golf club as well, in addition to other types of sports clubs like the hockey club and and whatever other whatever you think of, there's there's probably a fun club for it um, on the extracurricular kind of fun side. Sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> another question in that direction by Claudia. She's asking us if there are clubs in for topics in sustainability or energy markets. Most probably you do have that kind of activities. Yeah, for sure. So one club that I mentioned was the Net Impact uh, Net Impact Club. So that would be um, under like kind of the umbrella branch for those students that are interested in sustainability or careers in sustainability as well. So that would be one club that I would recommend that you look into would be the Net Impact Club. And they, they organize a variety of different types of events and networking opportunities and um, industry nights as well. Now a question regarding admissions uh, and going a little bit deeper into the tips for getting admitted to UBC. Uh, is, there a, is there any um, page limit to the, let me just see uh, who was asking us this, Manori is asking us, is there a page limit to the admission uh, essay, I suppose, because it's not finished in here. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so um, the essays are quite short. So there's going to be um, two 250 word essays, one 500 word essay, and then a 90 second um, video app, uh, video essay. So just a little bit about the essays, like you want to stay within kind of more or less the 250, like we say 250 word, like try to stay with like 250 words, you know, plus or minus like five, 10 words. Like it's okay if you go slightly over, like we're not going to penalize, but if you go a lot over, that's not good, right? Like you you, you want to stay within like 5% of that because you, you're trying to like convey a message concisely. Right. So that's the, the, you know, convey a convincing message concisely within like the parameters that we set. So that's part of the exercise is staying within that word limit to the best of your you know, abilities. Right. Sometimes you have a sentence, go over a few words at the end. That's fine. But don't go over by it too much. And the video essay um, it's not something that like we give you a, a, you know, like a topic and you have to answer right away. It's more like you we give you a topic area and then you take your time and you film something and then you upload that to YouTube or Vimeo and then you send us the link. So you can spend as much time on that as you like. But, but again, we say 90 seconds. So you want to stay like close to that. Don't do it too short either. Right. You want to like make the yes. You want to confine. Um, uh, conform to the parameters that we set, right? Just like, just as you would for a client project, we're we're looking at this um, in that way. So um, stick to the parameters that we set as much as possible. Don't go too short. Don't go too long. And um, and if you want to see examples of video essays that people have done in the past, you can just go to YouTube and just Google UBC MBA application video, and you would see like a lot of examples of what people have done in the past. So number one, we are looking for good content that you answered the question concisely. Um, but then like if you are creative and you want to do this, you are welcome to go creative with the application video as well, and you know video edit if to your heart's desire. We are if you don't have that, don't panic. Like it's we're we're looking at content first and foremost but if you are creative and you have that ability feel free to get creative with it as well perfect thank you and we are approaching the end of uh, the questions as we don't have too many more i will ask a, a final question in case there aren't any more i would like to ask uh, anyone who has a question to vivian to type them in uh, right now and uh, we have a question here regarding the career outcomes. Can you tell us in which industries uh, do UBC Solder graduates work primarily after they graduate and where? Yeah, so our grads end up in many different industries. So there's, there's we're not like a school that just churns out like one type of grad, right? Like a part of the, the appeal of going to a school at UBC is that there's a huge diversity of different types of industries that everyone can learn from. So we're not just churning out like bankers and consultants. We do churn out some bankers and consultants, but like we also churn out people that end up working in different types of sectors, like healthcare, for example, or they end up working in the technology sector. Um, they also end up working for, um, you know, F some big FMCGs internationally. Some of them end up, yes, working in banks, um, working for, um, you know, venture capital firms, working for um, consulting firms. So they, they really do end up everywhere. There's not really one industry that like dominates everything. They, they kind of go into different types. So, you know, big tech, they go into like startups, they go into um, starting their own businesses, working for big banks, um, working for um, venture capital, working for government, working for healthcare. So there's there's really everything that they end up going into. Right, and we have a question here by Ragit Khalifa, who is uh, asking us, my GMAT score will not be ready by the 5th of January. Will, uh, which is the deadline for admission I can send it to? Or is there any way to submit the GMAT score after the deadline? Probably he is asking if he can apply and then give you the, the GMAT score when it's ready. Yep. So you can absolutely apply by that January 5th deadline, um, you know, without the GMAT score. If that's the only thing missing, then just fill out the rest of your application and apply by that deadline and then send in the score when it's ready. So what's going to happen is that, you know, applying by the, the deadline means that your application was in early. <laughs> but we hold it until we get the GMAT score. But once the GMAT score comes in, your application will be queued according to when it came in. So it will like move up 
in the in the application queue which is advantageous like i said because we do it admit on the rolling basis so even though we will still hold your application till we get your gmat score it um it will be advantageous because once it comes in your application moves up according to the date that it was submitted okay that's perfect uh, we have final question final questions from jessica And she's asking us, um, number one, what is this, uh, how is the scholarship structured in terms of duration of courses? Will I have any obligations or any others with regard to the scholarship outside the application piece? So what do they have to do? So yeah, this is the question. Um, Probably this is if she has to, to give the application fees and then she will be uh, considered for the for the scholarship, right? Okay. So yes, you do have to submit like a complete application to be considered for scholarship. So you will have to submit the application, pay the fee, um, the application fee to be considered for scholarships. And then the scholarship decision, again, like I mentioned earlier in the application, in this presentation, it's based on a variety of different things, like whether you get a scholarship, we're looking at your academic profile to be strong, we're looking at your test scores to be in the competitive range, and then we are looking at your overall candidate profile about like what you communicate to us as your um, learning objectives and career objectives from doing the MBA and if all those things fit with what the UBC MBA offers then you're a strong candidate for scholarship um, and then we would um, let you know if you got a scholarship at the time of the um, admission decision so if you get an offer of admission from us you'll also know whether you got a scholarship but you absolutely do need to submit the application before you know whether you got a scholarship <laughs> 